TV has been around for a long time, right? It is, um, <laughs> the content is king and TV is still the main driver of ad sales and ad supported viewership. Um, programmatic video by comparison is, is in its infancy, still has a lot of challenges and a lot of issues. So this panel is really about how can, what can we do in terms of bringing those closer together? What are the issues in programmatic that buyers, sellers, enablers of that marketplace can help to solve that makes it look and function more like the highly efficient, well-trusted TV marketplace? And literally what can we do to start to unify those two marketplaces? Is there a desire for that? Are buyers asking for that? Are sellers ready to enable that? Um, so hopefully moving beyond just the typical programmatic panel, we're really going into what are the things that we can do to make programmatic video look, behave, transact more like a marketplace that is deeply trusted, established. So, so with that, um, I'd like to firstly ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, so I'll start to, am I right? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Talia Camaro. I look after our uh, Magnite's audience identity and measurement product. So speaking from a product perspective, Magnite is the largest independent omnichannel SSP. Hi, uh, my name's Abby Reichner, and I head up programmatic strategy and operations at Fox. I'm Eric Speck, um, based in the New York area here. I oversee our DSP partnerships uh, at Paramount. Um, so I'm Senior Director of Programmatic Partnerships. Hi, my name is Kevin Wagen. I'm the uh, director of video innovation and help lead up our centralized video innovation team at Denso. So thank you all. Um, so we probably all saw the Nielsen Gage report in July that showed that streaming has eclipsed TV viewership for the first time. But again, that wasn't, that was all viewing, not just ad supported viewing. So if we focus down on ad supported viewing and think about the TV marketplace, roughly a $60 billion marketplace about half of it is national, about two thirds of it trades in the upfront. So I guess the, the starting question is like, let's focus on the upfront. So Kevin, I'd like to ask you, how does, uh, how does a digital video fit into the national upfront for Dents? Yeah, so I, I think we've, we've probably crossed the threshold of um, digital video kind of being a, a, a secondary thought and, and it really, blends into our holistic upfront approach um, with linear as well as all cross-channel video mediums. Um, and I, I, I would say that we've been working pretty substantially with a lot of our partners um, over the last few years to ensure that we have very established digital rates, terms, um, from both a direct IO as well as a, as well as a programmatic standpoint, as um, we, we've certainly crossed the threshold of um, the viewership actually migrating there. So we utilize a lot of our internal and holistic planning tools to basically show where the dollars should flow within the marketplace. So, so Talia, I know you used to be at Freewheel. Um, you know, back in those days, programmatic was even more nascent, probably more focused on short form. And we talked about that there were a set of challenges and even bringing IO based video into the upfront. So firstly, like from your, you know, multiple seats in the industry, like what have you seen then versus what do you see now in terms of how programmatic video flows into an upfront? Yeah, totally. I, um, so that, so I, I built the upfront product or designed the upfront product for free will. Now many years ago, and uh, and when I was building a, a product, I was building up sort of primarily in partnership with Disney. And the main aim of the upfront product that we were building was to deal with the reconciliation of upfronts. And I think that that's it's worth mentioning that because I think that's one of the places that it becomes really hard to implement TV practices and programmatic. Programmatic is very much built around the idea of real time reconciliation. Uh, you never go back. You know, you never go back to to update things and the upfront product that I was building at the time was built around the idea that you were going to get uh, at the time, you know, Nielsen or maybe Comscore numbers in that was going to adjust the delivery of the deal so that we delivered less or maybe in some cases we delivered more than we expected and we were going to have to go fix that. And then, you know, goodness forbid those numbers come in on July 3rd. Now we have to change the Q2 spend and move upfront dollars into, you know, Q uh, that had been allocated into Q2, into Q3. So the whole product was built around kind of moving that 
what had been Excel spreadsheets into an automated product. I think, uh, you know, I haven't been, I, I work on audience and identity things at Magnite, so I haven't been as involved in the, sort of the uh, the management, day-to-day -day management of, of upfronts from a programmatic perspective at Magnite. But I think in general, you know, when I think about even just what I read in the trades about the upfronts, pretty much every major media media owner was out there talking about making programmatic part of their upfront. I think a couple of media owners, I think Disney was one of them, actually came out and said programmatic is going to be part of every single upfront deal um, that we made. I don't know if they made good on that. Maybe you do. But. I, I don't know. But Eric looks eager to jump in. So I'm going to ask Eric to jump in. Like I, so I always look eager. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> So, we, yeah, we, so, so for, yeah, so how did it work in, in Paramount's upfront? Yeah, from our perspective, um, I think we've been, we were sort of one of the first publishers to really take this head on and, and try to look at, look around the corner and um, approach the upfronts with a, a holistic viewpoint where we, we, we really wanted to welcome spend in programmatic. So um, I think it's been a couple of years that we've been out there allowing PMP or PG and PMPs to count towards uh, upfront commits. So we, we definitely embrace that. And I think, you know, this is uh, on the front lines up to senior leadership. I think we all really understand and accept the trend towards um, dynamic buying and programmatic and understand that this is a core tenet of what we can do as a publisher to offer our buyers is flexibility. Really, that's like one of our core themes this year is flexibility and simplicity. We really want to be able to be flexible to meet our buyers where they want to buy, how they want to buy, and also to make sure that we can support deal types and support activation pathways, whatever, whatever it takes, we want to make it as easy as possible for clients to transact with us. So, so Kevin, as a national investment lead, then I guess the, the point is you would make a commitment between Dentsu and Paramount, and that commitment could be activated in either digital video, PG, PMP, and Paramount is flexible across those? Yeah. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that it's, it's, it's been taking like kind of breaking down a lot of the barriers, um, over the last few years on a lot of this. And I think companies like Paramount Fox, et cetera, have seen the writing on the wall that from a yield management perspective, they can get more when they have some of the more flexible clients come in that may be net new advertisers. And I think over the last three or four years since the pandemic, um, started, Basically, a lot of even our largest clients have been asking for very substantial um, flexibility terms from an upfront perspective. So we just really need to work with all the partners to make sure that we can uh, get the demand and terms set up that make sense for all the clients across the board. Um, from the Fox perspective, I think uh, it's funny because I get asked this a lot. Do we think that with the sort of uptick of programmatic uh, interest from the buyers are, are the upfronts going to go away? And I always say, no, the idea of the futures market is always going to be there. Putting committed dollars down is, is going to be the way that we still transact and guarantee dollars towards a buyer. The difference here is really just how do we transact those dollars? And to Eric's point, having that flexibility of direct IO, PG, PNP is definitely, um, you know, where, where the writing is on the wall. What is, I would say, difficult, and we are talking about this, um, you know, on our prep call, I wouldn't say that we're like day one of the upfront transactions uh, executing programmatically, but I would say that we are in very early days. It's not like the direct IO uh, process that has been working for years now. We're still trying to figure things out. And whether that is, is there a PG, PNP split? What are the guardrails? And what platform are we using? There are so many different, I would say, like uh, components to executing an upfront deal programmatically. Some are dictated by the buyer, some are dictated by the seller. And if you think about the multiple SSPs, the multiple DSPs, they all kind of speak different languages. And so how on the supply side do we prepare ourselves for every single possibility that a buyer might come to us? We definitely want to be flexible. We want to support our client and each individual brand, and I'm sure Kevin can attest to this, have a different sort of programmatic buying strategy. So we need to be prepared on all fronts. I think um, where it differs perhaps from Paramount is we still sell uh, our por portfolio very separately because the content that Fox has under the portfolio is so different. 
We have, you know, Fox Sports. We have Fox News. So we want to make sure that we are able to uh, still provide the content that the buyer is interested in. And with that comes a slightly smaller footprint. So being able to uh, tr uh, guarantee those dollars against, say, a Fox Sport uh, buy is a little bit more difficult because we just simply don't necessarily have this entire scale that maybe IQ Paramount does. Yeah, and I'll just pile on to some of that. I think that to make this work seamlessly, there also has to be some sophistication on the buyer side to understand, you know, how to how to how to use their budgets and buy um, and meet their KPIs uh, when we're talking about executing PMPs. And you know, from our side, we we have a unified ad server, which was no small feat. You know, we have disparate endpoints between Viacom and Paramount and Paramount Plus and and uh, CBS. So. We had to unify the ad server and we've got to basically aggregate this scale and this helps us basically deliver um, when we have a, an upfront commitment running PMP. You know, we have guardrails, of course, and, and some some uh, some rules, if you will, that we communicate to our clients. But again, it's a, it's a two-way street and the client also has to understand uh, how programmatic works and, and be sophisticated in their buying strategy. But even with those guardrails, right, they're going to differ between Paramount and Fox. And how confusing is that for the buyer? So so, so let's make it more confusing then. So we've talked about uh, optionality and flexibility. You have different portfolios of assets. Buyers have different technology. Let's bring in then television and talk about like true unification of a total TV marketplace. Um, so, you know, as I understand the commitments between video, whether digital video or programmatic and TV, are generally speaking not flexible commitments in the upfronts, right? You don't really move dollars between those buckets. So I guess the, the question is, and, and Kevin, we'll start with you, like, do you see and your are your clients interested in and asking Dentsu to deliver um you know solutions for audience-based television plus programmatic video? Yeah. So I, I, I would say that this is something we've we've really started exploring. Um actually quite a few years ago um from an audience based television perspective um we've we've fully integrated across basically all of the different um networks audience based solutions um including to it on the uh stage with me today um and we've also built um a product internally at Dentsu that we've called Delta we've been pretty open with it in the press um but it's basically our solution to allow for full audience-based enablement of the linear marketplace from a um, index-based perspective, utilizing um, whichever client's data they want to use or our Mercury audience that is is Dentsu's um, audience management platform. Um, and I would say what we've done in, in um, I guess, collaboration with that while we've structured programmatic deal points as well as digital deal points across the whole marketplace, we've really tried to see where we can find interoperability between these two. So we've looked at, and Paramount's a really good example, we've basically pulled in um, some programmatic as well as digital extensions from our linear buys utilizing their Paramount Vantage product, and we've really allowed our buyers to buy a unified audience across both their linear portfolio, their one-to-one -one addressability, and their um, IQ Vantage digital property, yep. which I, I think is kind of a holy grail to a lot of advertisers utilizing audience. I mean, I'd love to like just push a little bit beyond that, though, going beyond one-to-one -one and reserved, you know, based activations into like programmatic as well, including PG, mm -hmm. of course. But I guess like, you know, Eric, can can you talk about like what you hear from clients in terms of? You know, do they desire, are they asking for like true unification of audience-based television with programmatic video? Huh. I think so. I mean, I think it's definitely a slow moving train, mm -hmm. uh, but we, this is our philosophy. You know, we've organized our sales teams to be convergent, you know, um, to eliminate silos. We have um, the Vantage product, which uh, we're talking about here, which is really meant to be a convergent access point to all of our inventory. So, it, you know, you can get a holistic view uh, across broadcast, uh, digital, cable, social, everything. And, you know, when we talk about reaching an audience, we try to do it through that lens where it's a convergent lens and we can 
we can essentially execute in each lane underneath, uh, within that. So from the buyer's perspective, I, I think that, you know, and, and you're the expert here, but I, I, I think that that is where the train is moving, you know, and, and we're definitely positioning our inventory and our, our sales teams to communicate and, and meet the buyer there as well. So, so Tal, you mentioned you focus on audience solutions and like fundamentally this is about finding audiences wherever they are and being able to transact the way that makes sense. Like what are you, what is Magnite doing or what do you see in terms of your clients asks and how you can help empower this? Yeah, I, well, I think um, what Eric just talked about is really important. First of all, just not, not even related to technology, but just, I, I think you have to have both the buying team and the selling team organized in such a way where their incentives encourage unification. Like if you have a separate TV buying team, linear TV buying team, and you have a separate CTV buying team, you're just really never going to get to full fluidity across the across the medium. So I think that that's really important. And I, I yeah, and I agree that you know Paramount is an example of that. I think there's a lot, there's an increasing number of examples of of that kind of sales team uh, or buying team unification across our industry. I think on the um, implementation side, and, and as to the question of sort of how do we do it. Um, in order to truly fluidly move, um, you know, move budgets or spend budgets across the different platforms, you have kind of two options. One option is you can um, have a single activation platform. Uh, that's I think we're we're a fair you know we're fairly far out from that as an industry. Um, there's a couple of players that are a little bit closer, but in general, if you think about the activation of linear TV, it's pretty separate from the activation of programmatic programmatically enabled CTV. Um, so then, you know, your second option is, is to react. Um, you know, you have delivery on linear TV and you react and go find the users that you didn't hit on linear TV or vice versa. You know, you just start with, um, you start with programmatic and CTV, for example, typically it goes the other way. Typically it's today it's, um, you know, a buy, a buy occurs on linear TV. Uh, some, you know, some third, third party or maybe the buyer themselves aggregates information about the users that they hit and then they're able to go find uh, those same users or, um, or you know, an increased set of those users in the programmatic. And that's where, you know, that's where Magnite is focused. And, and do you see clients doing things like setting up marketplaces like that are specifically the underexposed viewers or light TV viewers or anything that would, you know, sort of, you know, speak to the unification of those two markets with different yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't. I don't think I would describe it as setting up setting up marketplaces, but absolutely building audiences that are based on light TV viewership. Um, you know, low low cord cutters, non linear TV viewers, or heavy linear TV viewers. There's definitely, you know, I mean, there's a ton of players in the CTV space, and in particular with the when you look at the 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 sort of distributor category that have a lot of information about how folks are consuming their television and they're turning that into pretty rich, robust audience insights. And so I think the kind of lightest version of what I was just talking about of like something runs on TV and then you react to that in the programmatic space is to just go target, you know, cord cutters or go target folks that don't watch a lot of linear TV, even if they haven't happened to cut the cord. And that's kind of a good way to ease buyers into it. And you, I, we see a lot of that today. And I think that has been happening to a certain extent for a couple of years. Um, Abby, the next question is coming to you. So you can jump in on this one, but the next one is for you. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to the next one. So, you know, again, sort of like striking on the theme of like what works in TV, what is difficult in programmatic. Um, so I think we would all agree that like ultimately advertisers are trying to deliver, you know, messages to people, not to households, not to devices. Um, and you know, that, that works well in television. It is primarily transacted on a people-based currency, not exclusively, um, but primarily. Um, there's also been some solutions that have you know, arisen in IO-based video. And so like programmatic is, is that you know, ecosystem where it doesn't really work in terms of reaching people um, or counting people or valuing people. Um, Abby, like, what are you guys doing at Fox or even just like, how do you think of this challenge for your business, for your clients, you know, for buyers like him? Yeah, I mean, so I think we rely a lot on the the buyers and understanding what their success success metrics are and their KPIs. And a lot of the, the PMP activation, right, is allowing the buyer more control over the audience that they're looking for. Um, we really focus a lot on the content and following the audience of the content, whether that is on distribution channels or um, and really maintaining 
that viewpoint of the Fox audience on Fox content. So we're not really doing any like audience extension reach where we're talking about Fox audience on different platforms. I think it is up to the seller to kind of uh, understand that the supply is fragmented and aggregating all of that supply of that Fox content and packaging it up for the buyer for the ease of use. So that on the supply side is sort of how we're supporting the buyers and then allowing the flexibility for the buyer to really reach their intended audience through their targeting, their first party data, et cetera. So, so Kevin, I mean, what do you think about this topic? I mean, obviously like it could benefit sellers in that it expands inventory, but I mean, do you agree that fundamentally people are trying to reach a person with the message? Um, particularly like when we think about like the desire to like drive, uh, you know, potentially attention-based outcomes or other things, which are you know fundamentally about reaching people. How do you think about that as a buyer? Are you referring to like COVID specific around this? Sure. I mean, that, that's the term for sure. Yeah. So um, I, I think or over the last X amount of years, I think that the household has been basically what we look at in terms of TV viewership. Um, and we've, we've agreed to co-viewing terms with the majority of the, the large CTV marketplace over the last few years. And I think from a programmatic perspective, it's understanding the methodology or, I mean, I think that's what we've done over the last few years. It's understanding, do we agree with the methodology? Is it sound? Is it dynamic? We, we don't want to just agree to a, a, a fixed, um, index of people per household because I, I don't think that that brings in data that is rational into the equation, but I, it's really, we, we need to get to a place where there's kind of standardization across the programmatic marketplace, um, allowing for this. And there's a lot of back end back end census and, and proxy work that gets done when co factors are applied. Um, and that's just not mature in the programmatic marketplace. So I, I think we're willing to get there. I, I just don't think that we're there yet in terms of like interoperability between the systems and how it's counted. I question for Kevin, actually. So when we're talking about co-viewing, right, and we have this flexibility between direct IO and programmatic, co-viewing is like really technically not possible in the programmatic space. Yep. So how do you manage those those dollars shifting back and forth? We try to work as best partners as we can to basically like, I, I don't think we really operate under the world where we shift between direct IO and programmatic more than one initial time, hopefully, depending that we all do our jobs, right? Um, but I, I think that, I mean, I, it's 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 a marketplace conversation we need to have because if we agreed to a dynamic index on a pricing um, from a CTV perspective, there's obviously some type of negotiation that should be had by both parties if that has to go away. Um, a lot of that has been historically facilitated by Nielsen. So, I, I mean, it's it's been an ongoing topic over the last few years, to be honest. It's a really good question that I wish I had asked and written down. So, thank you for that, Abby. Um, so, so, Talia, like, I don't want to say just technical solutions, but I will start by asking, like, what technical solutions might there be to bringing co-viewing into programmatic? Yeah, you, you know, I'm very excited to talk about this. I talked before, before Mike, I kept him late on the call talking about co-viewing. Um, but... <laughs> So um, co-viewing is increasingly coming up with um, with a lot of the clients that, that I work with on the Magnite side of things. And um, there's really sort of three-ish, maybe four, depending on how you count them, solutions that that folks are are talking about. And I'd love to hear reactions to these where you have them. But, um, you know, the first is is what you just talked about and kind of next is the, just like a blanket. Every, every floor price gets a 1.2% percent increase because we're just going to assume that it's 1.2 people watching the viewership. Maybe that doesn't make a lot of actual logical sense, but the, but on average, it's 1.2. Fine. We just apply that. That's kind of the simplest. Uh, a more complex and I think controversial uh, idea is that at least where we have the information from the distributor or from the programmer that there are a specific set of people in the room that we actually fork the request. So you get, we would get one request from Fox, say, that um, that had the information that both, um, you know, that both Abby and her friend are watching this content together. And we would actually then send out two requests to the DSP with two different user IDs. Um, DSPs don't tend to love bid inflation. So that's that's a sort of its own issue. But that's that's sort of number two. And a more 
you know, I think a more interesting option, arguably, than the first. And then the third is is kind of the last solution that you got into of like we incorporate third party measurement. Um, lots lots of lots of players in the space now that are measuring co viewing on a case by case basis. I talked earlier about the the risks of implementing a non real time solution in real time programmatic. I think that's very complicated, but um, you know, but that would be arguably a more accurate, um, you know, and a more accurate measure without the sort of quote unquote bit inflation of the of the second option. So I'm curious if you all are hearing the same options or leaning towards any of those. I have a question on the first part. H how would you divine that Abby and her friend were watching together in one TV glass? There's, experience? yeah, it, uh, it would be hard. <laughs> you definitely can't do it on every with every distributor and with every programmer. Um, it, it would it would have to be selective where you can do that. But there's some ha households. I actually see this a lot in um, in a, a particular. Uh, a non-US market um, that has a lot of information about who's in the household when they're watching the content. Um, and so in that case, the set-top set box manufacturers are actually able to provide some information about these people are in the home, um, you know, tied to their mobile device or other other identifiers. And they could theoretically link that back to some kind of universal ID or, you know, cell site ID. Creepy. <laughs> yeah, definitely heard more about the measurement option, obviously. Um, for that option, it sounds like for the seller anyways, it would be incredibly hard to sort of manage our yield and forecast and know, you know, which opportunity has those two people versus which doesn't. So being able to determine that seems like a challenge uh, for, for that option. And every challenge is an opportunity, Absolutely. right? With the right I agree. optimization technology. Yeah, one, one last thing. I mean, to be honest, I... I I think there needs to be some kind of centralized agreement before any of this really happens outside of like testing. Um, and I think whether it's like coming from a centralized body or if it's one of the 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 big um, companies really vying in the currency space right now to and a few others, um, um, but to kind of um, work with whether it's. Experian, live ram someone that like understands the household at a people-based model even if it's proxied and really start applying some dynamic indexing and again i'm don't know enough about the tech side but i i think that there has to be some kind of centralized alignment across the board before we get somewhere yeah got it thank you helpful um so let's shift gears then and talk um uh, yet again about a thing tv does well which is helping buyers to understand the content and the context of their buys, right? Like you get a schedule, ads are placed on a log, you can have a do not air list, but basically like you know where you're gonna run. Um, that is less true in IO-based video and even less true in programmatic video. Um, there obviously like been a number of conversations around passing contextual signals, whether that's in a bid request or setting up marketplaces to sort of define um, the, the context and the quality. Um, you know, Abby, can I start with you and talk about and ask you about like how does Fox respond on those requests for contextual metadata or just desire from buyers to understand better where they're buying, what they're buying? Yes. So um, we absolutely want to service the client and provide them with the information that they need. And this is a common, common ask um, is to provide that content. Usually it's going to be show level data, but genre, content rating, et cetera. And a lot of the times it's asked for for us to provide that in the bid stream. And the problem on the supplier side, and I think I can speak for probably both and Eric, is a v VPPA. Uh, that's a privacy violation, essentially. And the way that we view it is very strict. So every supplier can kind of view that privacy law differently. And just from our perspective, we're really strict on and how we perceive that that privacy law. So it's really difficult for us to be able to send content data through the bid stream in real time. Um, it also depends on what the buyer's actually looking for. Are they looking for, to your point, understanding where that impression was placed and whether it's for validation or tracking their audience as uh, and using content as a construct for their audience? Uh, or are they looking to actually target against uh, that metadata? So honestly, either way, we're not in a place where we can send that information through. But what we do say is if it's for validation, we're happy to provide any sort of post-campaign reporting. 
we can provide that show level reporting. It just can't be in real time. We can work with folks like Iris to send through an ID that is that does not violate that privacy law and sort of gives the same context of possibly targetability or uh, validation to where the impression ran. Yeah, I want to double click into one thing you said, which is um, how the metadata is being utilized. And a lot of times we've sort of queried the buy side. We find out that it's not so much for targeting. It is more for the validation and the verification to see, you know, where they're, they're running, where their ads running. So we do also provide that show level list in post campaign reports. And, you know, most of the time that is really addressing the client's needs. So, you know, it's almost like when we get those questions, we have to step back a little bit and be like, well, what's the actual goal? Like, are you looking to cherry pick inventory and, you know, aggregate all of your spend on one show? Because that's not a scalable solution for us and for you. And, and usually the buyer doesn't want to do that. <laughs> you know, it's just sort of talking through what the goal is. Um, and that's, that's, you know, the, it's the transparency question comes up a lot. Like Abby said, it, it's really, you know, almost, I, I would say in every conversation, you know, we try to be as transparent as possible. We send a bunch of signals in the bid stream that allow for targeting. And, um, and then we give post campaign reportings that I think really satisfy what most buyers are after. So even if like in the open RTB spec, you have a content object and you can put something in there. So Kevin, if you, if you get that, what is it you want to do with it? So Eric asked the goals, what are the goals? I, I mean, I, I think that's a great question and I'm sure like every client would probably approach that differently in the marketplace. I think, I, I mean, obviously there has to be some query and some aggregation done in the back end, and I, I think that where a lot of this is really stemmed from is a lot of our buy or a lot of our clients are historical TV buyers. They're used to the transparency that linear legacy linear TV has provided, and they just want that back. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with aggregator reports they send up to CMOs, things like that. So I think what a lot of, as we've understood that BPPA or some content dis distribution deal points um, don't allow for show level reporting, we've asked for a lot of signals from the bid stream and with, in, in things like show level reporting, look at it from an aggregated perspective. But I think we, we've gotten to a place of um, where we, we, it's more so either validation on the back end or doing some contextual targeting on the front end. She had mentioned Iris earlier. We just released a product called Intextual Intelligence where we're basically leveraging an Iris ID in a data compliant way to do contextual targeting on the front end. And we've asked a, a lot of key partners to allow for that enablement and we've gotten relatively substantial adoption in the marketplace. And I, I think we're just getting to a place where we want to align a messaging with content again. And, and I think we're making a lot of strides there. One other footnote, you know, there's, we, we've, we've asked our DSP partners if they're using content signals to transact, right. To target. And most of them aren't. And they're only, if they are, it's like using um, a genre. And most buyers aren't even using that actually. So the capability might be there, but they're not activating on it. So it's still a murky sort of topic for a lot of people and like what is, uh, what functionality supported and, you know, when and how we use it. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, I feel like some of that is just to do a lack of standardization around Definitely. what, you know, what actual signal, what the categories are that could be passed in any one of those, uh, in, in when it, any one of those sort of boxes within the ORTB framework, I think. Like it reminds me a little bit of the ideas behind seller defined audiences where like publishers have been defining publisher defined audiences for well over a decade. Those have existed for a long time. But what, what was new with seller defined audiences was the ability to pass those to DSPs in a standardized way, like on the, in the sort of, with the sort of standard taxonomy. Like that's, that's the kind of thing that when, when, um, you know, the, the question of contextual metadata sharing comes up, that's, those are the kinds of things that we talk about with our clients. And I, um, I do think it's a little bit of a confluence here of like, you've got the regulatory issues with VPPA, you've got the um, sort of special sauce business issues of like, 
this is our this is our our this is the this content this information about this content is the reason that buyers come directly to us to build direct deals so you don't necessarily want to give that up and then you have some of the just limitations in terms of standards and tech yeah i mean i think that's that's a great and the right summary is like it's a confluence of many things like Kevin may want exact show in the in the bid request so that you could align show to messaging, even if we are not really, and even if that's not really possible yet, but it's not in everybody's interest. And until we sort of like bring all sides together and find that compromise, um, they're going to have to be these middle ground solutions until the technology can even act on the signals, sort of what is the point? Um, okay. Interesting. So, okay. Yet another thing in television that works pretty well is there's really no concept of fraud. There's really no concept of invalid traffic. Yes, there are some concerns about whether the currency actually measures what it says it's measuring. Um, and obviously, like that's getting better and addressed. But by comparison, programmatic is you know, the absolute wild, wild west, which is why we have verification vendors, non-human traffic vendors, like all of these things that don't, would never even you know, think to exist really in the television marketplace. So, so Kevin, if I can start with you and just ask, what is it that Dentsu does in terms of validating, you know, validating programmatic video. And, and as part of that, can you talk about, is there any difference between how you view a Paramount and a Fox in those processes and technologies versus the broader marketplace? Yeah, I would say that, um, I mean, we, we work, um, pretty hand in hand with our Eva Bronson, who leads up our global brand assurance team, um, on enabling with whether it's a IS or a DV or whoever may be from an integration standpoint um, on the front end. And I would say from a programmatic perspective, we've kind of developed a, a pretty curated marketplace strategy over the last three years that I think has led us to where we are with the rapid emergence of PMPs and just the programmatic marketplace is that we um, align ourselves with trusted partners, with the content itself, with the content itself, or with whoever is closest to the source of the content itself. So whether it be a device, an OEM with basically um, uh, supply that they have exclusivities to sell, or someone like a Magnite who sits that close to the content itself that we do know it's trusted. And we really try to not operate in the open exchange where we can, because if you read all the reports, anytime a... Um, fraudulent activity is exposed or whatever, it's typically occurring in the open exchange. So we try to set up as direct deals as we possibly can, curate app site lists as well, and use a lot of third parties to help curate those. And so even though when you have a curated partnership, you're still applying third party technologies to validate and verify that inventory. That's yeah, that's typically okay. All right. Um, I mean, Eric, Abby, I don't know if either of you or who wants to jump in on this one, but like how does that impact your business or like, how do you interact with buyers around verification? Yeah. Um, yeah, first off, I, you know, I, I think that we look at this, uh, in a few ways, you know, when you talk about a lot of IBT, SIBT, um, that can essentially come about through integrations, integration points. So I think we have a really strong vetting process for a lot of our partners. Um, and secondly, you know, we we have a partnership with Moat and integration with Moat, and we work with them on all of our endpoints to monitor that. So, and then, um, you know, Freewheels or Ad Server and uh, our, one of our SSPs, and I know that they've got a very uh, active and deep um, fraud team, and I, I, they work with a few partners. I'm not quite sure. I think Human might be one, but um, you know, this is we we definitely take it seriously and we also definitely support buyers when they apply brand safety or other um other systems i mean we also have our inventory uh, uh index as ads.txt and app dash as.txt and we use we set a seller id so we can use sellers json so we try to our best to use all the methodologies out there to protect the buyer so you, you integrate with all the standard ways you help to sort of like pass signals that will allow Dentsu to evaluate your inventory. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, tell you anything that Magnite is specifically doing to help solve these problems? Um, I, I I mean, a lot of the same things that were just talked about and working with our partners to make sure ads.txt is implemented across the board, making sure that we and thus the buyers can understand who exactly they're going to pay in the supply chain um, as a part of that process. 
in general, the way that we think about IVT and fraud is that there's a sort of like real time vetting process as requests come in where we'll, you know, we'll throw out requests that we think are fraud or more, more likely to, to be fraud and then maybe go work with those publishers to say it's bad. Um, and then there's and then there's kind of an after the fact reckoning and that that's done in partnerships um, as a sort of the real time analysis with human and, and others. But um, but there but we also have a pretty big um, sort of fraud detection team that's just looking at the, um, you know, looking at our data and analyzing the data for anomalies in the data and then going to investigate what's happened. You know, why are we saying this IP address 18 million times, whatever it is. Um, so Abby, you can have the last word on this with 30 seconds left in the panel. All right. One thing that I, I just want to double tap on what Talia said is it's a lot about transparency, right? So if we are working, Eric and I are working with uh, partners and we're working through the integration to kind of tag IET, it's also really important to understand the pre-bid filtering and what's being filtered and that transparency of what the IVT is so that we can understand and hopefully try to fix it. So through the course of this panel, we've brought programmatic video to the upfront. We've unified the marketplace. We've brought person level measurement, contextual metadata, um, IVT and fraud to the to the marketplace. So I think we've solved all the problems. <laughs>